Change is so hard for us humans. But as Pema Children said, it is an incontrovertible fact of life. And I realize that this is neither a new nor profound statement, but it is one that we need to hear from time to time. We cannot avoid change, nor do we ever have any control over our lives. And we all know this, and yet when we are confronted by it, we are usually surprised, anxious, frustrated. I am certainly no stranger to change. I was just ordained in April 2018. Now here I am in my first ministry, living in a state where I had never even visited before this ministerial opportunity presented itself. <laughs> Any one of these would be a big adjustment, but all three of them together has been kind of a lot. <laughs> Those are all major life changes. Uh, I have to say, I think the one that's been the biggest adjustment is living in a new area. <laughs> Before coming here in August, I well, actually it was July. I came here in July. I had lived in Massachusetts for seven years prior to that, and for that I lived in Texas my whole life. When I moved from Texas to Massachusetts in 2011, I was very caught off guard by the differences between the two places. <laughs> <laughs> So when I moved to Michigan in July, I thought, okay, it's going to be different. I know now to look for those differences. Y'all, <laughs> it's different in different ways. <laughs> I keep ordering Coney dogs with cheese and being surprised when they come out covered in cheese sauce. Mm -hmm. Now, I've only ever lived in Texas and Massachusetts, so I don't know about the rest of the world, but I will tell you that if you order a pony dog with cheese at either one of those places, it comes with shredded cheddar. <laughs> cheese sauce is perfectly fine, but it just keeps surprising me. <laughs> you would be shocked the number of times this has happened. <laughs> and so it is with all change. We know that change is a fact of life, and really the only thing upon which we can depend, right? But it keeps surprising us, like me and that cheat sauce. One of the sources of Unitarian Universalism and a place from which we can draw meaning is the wisdom of world religions that inspire us to ethical and spiritual living. We are welcome to learn from all of the religions of the world, and we are free to take on the practices of those traditions as they speak to us. And to my mind, there is no better program for coping with change than the four noble, four noble truths of Buddhism. Now, it might be helpful to have a little refresher on the origins of Buddhism here. The word Buddha means awakened one, and it was a term of respect that was given to a man living in Nepal sometime between the 4th and 6th century BCE, before the Common Era. Now, there are conflicting reports about this man's name, and other various titles, but he is most frequently called Siddhartha Gautama. The story goes that Gautama was born into a wealthy Hindu family, and he spent his youth shielded from all unpleasantness, especially the realities of life for the poor. As a young man, he experienced a spiritual awakening that sent him on a path of spiritual exploration, and for the first time he encountered sickness, poverty, and death. These experiences shocked and confused him. He sat down under a Bodhi tree to meditate and over time. Some versions say days, some say weeks, some say months. He gained insight into the nature of life. And his new understanding came to be called the Four Noble Truths. Now, you may have heard the first noble truth is life is suffering which is sometimes called the bad news of Buddhism. <laughs> American Buddhist 
Our teacher and author, Lama Surya Das, however, is emphatic that the Buddha would never said that life is suffering. This is an unfortunate case of something lost in translation. The word the Buddha actually said is dukkha, D-U-K-K-H-A, dukkha. The word actually shares linguistic roots with difficulty, frustration, anxiety. English speakers commonly substitute the word suffering, but that word has connotations that are not native to the word dukkha. But since the kind of stuck, that's what most Buddhist teachers will use. So Lama Surya Das translates the first noble truth as suffering exists. Not so much that life is suffering, but that suffering is a part of life. Now, this is an indisputable fact. <coughs> All living creatures encounter suffering. There's been enough uh, viruses going around in our community that I think we all know this is true. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true that if taken independently, this idea that suffering exists could sound a bit pessimistic, but remember that that is the first of the four. <laughs> Once we have accepted that suffering exists, then we are ready for the second truth, which is that we play a role in our own suffering even if we do so unwittingly. There are a few different causes of suffering, but what we'll focus on today is attachment to outcomes. When we have an attachment to a certain outcome and that is disappointed, we experience suffering. And we're convinced we know what's going to happen and it doesn't, we suffer. The third noble truth is sometimes called the good news of Buddhism and that is that there is a way to end suffering. Cessation of suffering is the goal of all Buddhist spiritual practice. There is a way to end the anxiety, frustration, and the disappointment that comes from our attachment to outcomes. Unfortunately, it is not some kind of superpower that allows us to bend the world to our will. The way to end suffering is through discipline of the mind, evenness of the mind, that allows us to let go of our attachment to outcome. And the way that we do that is through the Eightfold Path. <laughs> to end suffering through the Eight Noble Path, through the Eightfold Path is the fourth noble truth. Each aspect of the Eightfold Path has multiple interpretations, which we're not going to get into today. Again, this is just a brief flyover experience of Buddhism. <coughs> but the Eightfold Path does include knowing the truth, telling the truth, doing the right thing, earning a living from virtuous work, and so on. We tend to think that if we could control outcomes and or control people, that we would be free of suffering. And Buddhism affirms just the opposite. Happiness does not come from controlling anything other than ourselves. And the Eightfold Path is how we learn to do that. What's important to realize here is that the cessation of suffering is placed on each of us as individuals. And on one hand, this is incredibly freeing because it means that we are capable of ending our suffering. But on the other hand, it means that each one of us is responsible for ending our own suffering. In the spiritual program, there is no room for ideas like, I'm unhappy because my boss is such a jerk, <laughs> or once I finish this degree, then I'll be happy. Those are attachments to outcomes. What if you change departments to get away from your boss and you find yourself twice as miserable as you were before? <laughs> what if you finish that degree and you're still unhappy? Could be good, could be bad. <laughs> the four noble truths start by acknowledging that you cannot have control over the events in your life but it concludes by offering a way to take control over the emotional response that you have to those experiences. So, to go back to the misadventures that I've been having as a new Michigander, we can conceptualize the Four Noble Truths like this. One, suffering exists, and so do regional differences. <laughs> when I order cheese on a pony dog in Michigan, it will be made with cheese sauce. Two, attachments are the cause of suffering. The root of my surprise is that I expected shredded cheese because I forgot that cheese sauce is a thing every time. <laughs> Three, 
it is possible to end suffering. I am responsible for my surprise, and there are ways that I cannot be surprised by the cheese sauce. <laughs> and four, the end of suffering is achieved through the Eightfold Path. With right thought, I could remember that cheese sauce is a thing here. Also, Coney dogs are fine without cheese, and maybe I could just be happy with the way things are. <laughs> <laughs> my ongoing struggle with cheese sauce as a lighthearted way of exploring how Buddhist ideas can support us through time and change, but I hope that it is obvious that this applies to life's more serious struggles as well. My deepest exposure to Buddhism was in 2010 when I was part of a yoga teacher training program in Austin, Texas. The studio where I was studying practiced a style of hatha yoga that was blended with Buddhist philosophy. And this was another time in my life when I had been through a significant amount of change. Jesse and I had been married for about a year. I had a stable job and a car, and we lived in a sweet little house. But all of that was very new. From the summer of 2007 through the fall of 2008, I had been living well, well below the poverty line. I had been through the end of my first marriage. I had been fired from my first job outside of graduate school, my first professional job ever. My car had been totaled while it was parked on the street in front of my house. And so to dig myself out of this hole, I worked at what we'll call a well-known national chain of coffee shops. <laughs> I owned two pairs of pants, they were both okay. <laughs> I rode a bike to get everywhere, and that bike was literally found in the dumpster by some friends of mine. I moved in with a friend that needed a roommate, and I slept on a futon pad on the ground. And that's how I lived for a little over a year. I know that I ate a can of beans for dinner at least once. But eventually, things started turning around, and I do have to give Jesse a lot of credit for helping me get back on my feet during that time. So we fast forward to 2010, and here I was. I had a job, I have a loving and supportive spouse, I have a car, I have enough time and enough money to be in a yoga teacher training program. It seemed like everything was getting back together for me, and things were the way they were supposed to be, and I was terrified. I was afraid of losing everything again. Through the experience of having been as stripped down as I was, I came to realize that there is nothing Nothing that separates me from a person of less fortunate circumstances than fortune and circumstance. A few years prior, it had been really easy for me to lose everything. It had been very hard for me to get it all back, and now I was aware that I was not entitled to a single thing. So what was keeping me from losing it all again? And into all of this anxiety came Buddhism in a completely different way of looking at the world. It is 100% true that we cannot control the seasons of life any more than we can control the seasons of the year. But what we can control is our relationship to those seasons. I did experience some more ups and downs after my yoga teacher training, which should be expected of any significant span of time. What was different, however, was a hard-won sense of the long view. Having been through an incredibly difficult period of time followed by an intense study of Buddhism, when I encountered the next period of struggle, I knew that, with enough patience, I would get through it. All experience is temporary, even when it is all-consuming, all-consuming and deeply uncomfortable. It will eventually end. Could be good, could be bad. Too soon to tell. Our goal is to be like the farmer from that message today. But that was a story about me, as I indicated towards the end of telling it. There would be a lot more wailing and gnashing of teeth, maybe playing on the floor and punching and screaming at the air. 
That's what you do when the bad things happen, right? And when the good things happen, there's unsufferable celebration. <laughs> and we alternate back and forth and back and forth with the seasons of our life. I think that's the way that most of us are most of the time, which is why we have stories like that. And that's why we have the good work of Tim the Children and Lama Suri Thoughts to help us be guided to a, a state of a more even mindset. The ultimate goal of Buddhism and yoga is to cultivate equanimity of mind, evenness of mind. I am much better at this than I once was. There's less yelling and laying on the floor now. <laughs> but it's something that needs constant attention in me to have a lot of feelings. I think a lot of us have a lot of feelings. As Pim and Schroeder lifted up in the excerpt, that I just shared as our second reading. Our natural default seems to be feeling disheartened and anxious about the very nature of our being. But what brings us through this and into an even greater evenness of mind is the understanding that whatever befalls us, whether it seems good or bad at the time, whatever it is, will eventually change. We tend to see change as a result of our actions, the actions of another person, we think of it as an indictment of our behavior or our worthiness when things do or don't go the way that we had hoped. That is the trap of attachment. When we start to think that our aspirations can impact our outcomes, we're setting ourselves up for heartache. We are not in control. And the wisest course of action is not to view change as good or bad, but just simply what is. I really appreciate what Pema Children said about understanding change as a vehicle for growth. It's not good, it's not bad, but it's an opportunity for us to learn about ourselves, to deepen our understanding of life. And when we can accept change with grace and openness, we step off the hamster wheel of attachment. We stop putting stock in this nonsense idea that we cause or fail to cause a particular outcome. And only then, can we start to take control over the one thing that we really can control? Ourselves. Our responses. All change has the power to shape us. And we get to determine if that shaping contributes to our growth. So, let us be brave and let it go of our feeble attempts to control the world. Let us focus instead on loving what is. Let us be open to change and willing to let change be our teacher. Amen.